here. Their heavens have opened. I was hoping to uh, check in. Check in? But you've always been here. Excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were my husband. You must be Sergeant Angel. Yes, I am. I'm Joyce Cooper. I trust you had a pleasant trip. Fascist. I beg your pardon? System of government characterized by extreme dictatorship. Seven across. Oh, I see. It's uh, fascism. Fascism. Wonderful. Now we've put you in the castle, sweet. Bernard will escort you up there. Well, uh, actually, I could probably make my own way up. Hag. I beg your pardon. Evil old woman considered frightful or ugly. It's twelve down. Oh, bless you. Anyone familiar with England will be aware that there has always existed a minor tension between the island's rural and urban communities. Now, this is not particularly disruptive. Everyone tends to rub along quite well. But the two environments are clearly different. And these differences manifest in the sorts of people you tend to find there. For example, growing up, our view of city folk was that they were cool and independent, but self-serving and lacked any sense of community. Whereas, if you lived in the country, you might have been green-fingered and well-to-do, but ultimately stale and closed-minded. Now, these are stereotypes, of course, but I submit there is some truth to them, and in the case of the countryside, this actually makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you live remotely, among a relatively small group of people, you're more likely to know them, first of all, you're more likely to share things in common, and you're more likely to have roots in the locality. Your family may have resided there for generations, which will naturally produce a strong feeling of belonging and a related desire to protect this condition from outside influence. Things are as they are, and you like it that way. A mindset famously parodied by the sitcom The League of Gentlemen, which is set in the fictional village of Royston Vasey, and features two characters who own a shop. A local shop for local people, and they are very firm on the point. This is a local shop for local people. There's nothing for you here. I can pay. Keep your hands where I can see them. <laughs> Get out, do you hear me? This is a local shop for local people. There's nothing for you here. Demons! And of course, the joke is layered because more outsiders show up, don't they? And by the end of the show, the shopkeepers are killing them and burning the bodies. But this English trope is as old as the hills. The hapless urbanite who stumbles upon an isolated community that's doing its own thing and likes it that way, thank you very much. There's an entire subgenre of cinema that deals with it, from straw dogs to sightseers to Eden Lake, and evidently they're gross exaggerations for the purposes of dramatic effect, which I have no problem with, that's totally valid. But the reason they work at all is because they expose a kernel of truth, which is these places are close-knit, they are established, they are traditional, and for strangers that can be intimidating, because you feel excluded. You feel as though it's not for you, which, of course, in all honesty, it isn't, right? It's for them, and that's kind of the point. So, with all that in mind, you can imagine, when faced with an article like this, I feel like smashing my own head in. The English countryside was shaped by colonialism, 
Why rural Britain is unwelcoming for people of colour, which, of course, is the ultimate sin. I mean, I think if Dante could have devised a tenth circle, being unwelcoming for the bleeps would <laughs> probably land you there. Didn't I just establish the stereotype is that rural Britain is unwelcoming across the board? Now, like I said, it's largely exaggerated, okay? The countryside is full of warm, generous folk, and most of us understand that. But to the extent in-group preference, for example, exists there, do you think for a second this article will prove an honest and impartial exploration of that phenomenon? Do you think the author will have the good grace to consider that rural psychology is complex, and any trivial suspicion directed at outsiders may result from a genuine love of home, appreciation for what you have, desire to protect it, and that there could be some virtue in that? Nope, no chance. It's the same boilerplate, cut and paste, one-size-fits-all explanation for everything. You're just a bunch of racists. And look, it's so boring. I mean, is anybody else bored by this? Bored. What? Bored! No. Bored! Bored! The word urban has become synonymous with people of colour, particularly black people, has it? I fucking hope not. I heard that. It's expected that minority groups can be found in big, bustling metropolitan cities where they are likely to have migrated for economic opportunities. But cities don't just offer financial prosperity, there are other motivations for living in large multicultural societies, including acceptance of diversity. I, I love the, the sombre language. She doesn't even realise she's doing it. The cities carry an acceptance of diversity. Acceptance truly is the word, isn't it? Well, it's the final stage of grief. After all, I mean, I'm not there yet. <laughs> I'm somewhere between anger and depression, if you must know. I've been stuck there for about 10 years, <laughs> sort of on a loop. It's not your fault. I know. Rural England is pretty white. <laughs> Which isn't surprising, considering the UK is a majority white country. That should be the end of the article, right there. Right. Amazingly, it ain't. Amazingly, this person goes on for what must amount to about 1,500 words, right? It's a bloody essay, which I'm not going to read all of because life is too short. But suffice it to say, she's not okay with that, all right? The fact that the UK is a majority white country is the problem because Wherever you have white people, you have racism, and wherever you have racism, black people suffer. So the solution is get rid of the whites. Get rid of white cities, get rid of white towns, get rid of white statues, get rid of white stuff. Just, just fuck off, whites, okay? That, that is OT8 of their particular cult. Okay, it's revealed truth, it's what they all believe, and my question to you is simply this. Are you happy with that? Because <laughs> I've got to tell you... I'm not happy with that. Sorry? I'm not happy with that. You get extra money don't if care. you're worried about that. Don't care. I'm not bothered, I just, I just don't want to do it. Full stop. Right, okay. According to the Office for National Statistics, in every region, of England and Wales, white groups were least likely to live in an urban location, and people from Asian and black ethnic groups were most likely to do so. This may be part of the reason why suburban areas have been reported to be unwelcome for the minorities living in these spaces. Oh, I see! So, you're not concerned with the possibility that urban areas have become unwelcome for the native 
population, which might explain why white groups are least likely to live there. Oh no, <laughs> because that would put some responsibility upon the shoulders of the pox, right? Uh, upon upon the POCs. And we can't have that. Uh, didn't you hear? Black people can't be racist. Black people can't be racist. Prejudice, yes, but not racist. Sure, Jan. In 2011, a report from the University of Leicester entitled Rural Racism <laughs> said there are frequent and alarming forms of racism that affect ethnic minorities in the countryside. They're so dramatic. Now, see, to me, alarming, that's a serious word, right? I mean, an alarming form of racism would be a lynching or something. <laughs> I don't think they're happening with any degree of frequency in the Cotswolds. Authors said minority ethnic incomers were often treated with suspicion. Oh, very alarming. As many white rural residents felt that they belonged only in the city, with all its concomitant negative attributes of noise, pollution, crime, and crucially for some, multiculturalism. Why is negative in scare quotes? Are we supposed to regard crime as a positive now? Is that what you're hoping to bring with you? You know, the Lake District's beautiful. If only it had more crime. Would you like some crime? <laughs> well, I tell you what, come to the countryside, commit one, and find out, okay? You'll be in that wicker man quicker than Edward Woodward. A 2004 academic study by Neil and John Garland also showed that racism happens more often in the countryside than in towns and cities. Yeah, sure it does. And obviously, I don't have access to that study. But how much do you want to bet it doesn't measure any racism? A, by minorities towards whites, which happens way more than the reverse. B, between minorities, which again is a real thing. And that it's just one big fuck whites circle jerk. Because I'll take that bet. I'll go, I'll go fucking all in on that one. May I? Uh, maybe. Let's eat. This can range from name calling to physical violence, to excluding people of color who live in the countryside on the grounds that they won't fit in. Well, many of them are overweight, so. And it's not just people's lived experiences of racism that leads to minorities feeling alienated from living in the countryside. Some say that the history of the land and country houses serve as a reminder of the subjugation of black people and other minority ethnicities. Good. I mean, what am I supposed to say to that? What do you think I can or would be prepared to do about that? Torch the land? Tear down the country houses? Because I got news for you. The raison d'etre of my existence is not to provide therapy to black people, okay? If they, through some bizarre combination of acute narcissism and tribal paranoia see themselves in the long dead victims of the British Empire, that's on them. Or at least it should be. The trouble now, of course, is this psychosis has affected the rest of us. And the bottom line is, we don't deserve it. You want to talk about lived experiences? There was a couple of minority families that moved into my town when I was a boy, right? And as far as I know, they're still there. <laughs> we didn't harass them or chase them up to the top of the village windmill like Frankenstein's monster. <laughs> and with time, they became part of the community. But here's the thing. They had to work at that because they were strangers. And unlike in the city, that actually means something in a rural neighborhood of 5,000. And the fact they look different, sound different, prepare different food, etc. I'm sorry, 
it's going to throw up additional barriers. That's not our fault. And we have a right to create the places that we want to live in. And that process has been going on for thousands of years on these islands. Okay, I see no reason why we should stop now, particularly if the request to do so is barbed and offered by a cynical, anglophobic, crypto-Marxist nutjob. Okay? Here ends the lash. Anyway, you don't want to hear any more of that fucking chutney. I mean, it just goes on. Uh, churches are racist. The castles are racist, apparently. <laughs> if a leaf falls off a tree, it's racist. So, I'll tell you a quick story instead. I spent much of my early 20s exploring the Far East, principally China, and on balance had a terrific time. Uh, wherever I was, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Guilin, didn't matter. The people I met were interesting, dynamic, went out of their way to welcome me, and I'll never forget nor cease to appreciate that. One summer, I found myself in a certain picturesque little village of Nanjing County, that shall remain nameless, and decided to stay there for a while. It became pretty clear early on, however, that some of the locals weren't too happy about that. At least, that's what I ascertained from being spat on, and not in a good way, refused service in a restaurant, which was really unusual, apparently beggars can be choosers, and receiving broken and mispronounced English swear words as they were hurled across the street in my direction. And maybe with hindsight, I was overreacting a little. I mean, it was a handful of isolated incidents after all, but I thought, you know what, I'm not feeling this. I've given it a month. Uh, there's clearly some friction. Uh, this isn't good for anyone. I don't have to be here. So, do you know what I did? I left. Yeah. What do you mean, yeah? No, well, you know me mum and dad have sort of uh, moved from Manchester, they've retired now in Wales. Oh, right? yeah. And it is... Uh... <laughs> Look at his face, turning his nose up. No, but... It it is pretty depressing. Do you know what I mean? It's just one of them places that uh, it's like you go back in time and that when you go there. I mean, maybe the major cities there, maybe Cardiff is all right. What? Even coming from Manchester, it's like going back in time. It's just uh, it's like one of them places. That w it feels like every day is Sunday. Do you know what I mean? It's it's just depressing and grey and slate Lots of everywhere. Lots walking around going, I'm late. <laughs> well, yeah, here's, here's the sort of attitude they have, right? This, and this is true, because my mum and dad live there and that, right? And they love it, it's alright, it's an healthy place to go when you get older and that. But, this this is why they don't move on in Wales. Well, because it's like to make another, <laughs> no, no, sorry no. to any Welsh people listening, we're not saying you don't move on, Carl is. No, but... Sorry about the little Chinese shoes again The thing as well. is, it's good that, in a way, that they do do that, and they don't want to be like, you know, rushing about everywhere, because... The way London is isn't that great either, is it? Because sure. it's totally opposite mm. here, right? Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not having a go. It is a bit dull. I think even people who live there will agree with me, okay. right? But like one of the shops that my mum and dad use, right? It's only a little sort of villagey type shop. Uh, can't be bothered staying open for hours and hours, right? Because there's not enough people to use the shop. Yeah. So what you do is uh, they get used to what you buy, and they leave they, it out. They put it in a phone box outside. They put it in a phone box? Yeah. So it doesn't get wet. So my dad's loving that. Well, Once yeah. he found that out, it was like, brilliant. But that, how is that a bad thing? That's brilliant. Well, it's not. For other people, it is for my dad. Cos he's picking up all sorts of stuff. Oh, chickens. no, he's not! Oh, yeah. He's not nicking other people's shopping. Well, it's not like nicking, is it? Cos it's not theirs yet. <laughs> oh! And you've stitched him up on radio. Well, of course, because yeah. they're going to think, who's that? Wh who is there in town with a mank accent? Who, who, keeps, ma lot, who yeah. keeps making phone calls <laughs> and is getting fatter? Yeah, that's the. I love that. Up, I love that. That your dad was excited when he found out 
Oh. I can't believe, I can't believe that he's moved there, he's retired to this little village where it's based on trust and community and he's abusing it, he's using his scally mank ways. Bloody hell, like us, there's no bread again. <laughs> there's old women Was going empty? hungry, yeah. the cats aren't getting fed, and your father is just, I can't, oh, that's obscene, that's obscene. Oh, I think it's a die thief, that oh. fella from <laughs> Manchester. I don't even think they've got Sky there yet, have they? They can't listen, they won't, they won't know what's... I think you've stitched him right up. I hope you have, actually, I hope he goes down for it. Right, well, <laughs> He's uh... out of the choir. <laughs> yeah.